Tonight's story is called Casting the Runes by M. R. James. I was having a little party. We were telling stories round the fire. The evening was going so well. And then my dear friend Sissy began a little contra Q. Wallace. He'd written a book of ghost stories, and she'd been rather rude about it in December's edition of The Free Woman. Is reviewing really such a vile occupation? That depends on how it is practiced. It can have very unpleasant repercussions. For the author? Sticks and stones, surely. I mean, for the reviewer. Really? I could tell you a story to illustrate my point. Oh, yes. Do tell us another story, Mr. Wallace. Miss Fairfield might not like it. It's not a very nice story. <laughs> I'll be brave. Very well. And who is the unimpeachable authority from whose very lips you heard this story? Mrs. Gayton. She is the secretary of the Society for the Research of Supernatural Phenomena. Oh, no vested interest then. <sighs> Mrs. Gayton was dining one evening with a couple of friends. I'm being bombarded by letters from a chap named Carswell. Who is he? He's written a book, The History of Witchcraft. It got a review in the Society magazine, not a very friendly one. Edward Dunning wrote it. He knows about that sort of thing. Said the book was absolute rubbish. Gave it out rather hot and strong. Now this chap Carswell is making the devil of a fuss. Wants to know who wrote the review. He's made trouble before. Well, I hope you didn't tell him it was Mr. Dunning. Oh, of course not. You mentioned Carswell? Yes. Lives in Lufford Abbey? I believe so, yes. He's a neighbour of ours, you see, near our country place in Warwickshire. Really? We know all about him. Horrible man. They say he practises the most appalling rites there, and that he's very easily offended and never forgives anybody. Oh, dear. Tell them about the school children. Oh, Lord, yes. He offered to give the village children a treat. Had them up to the hall, which was odd, because he'd been complaining of their trespassing in his park. But he put on a magic lantern show for them. He began with some comparatively mild things. Little Red Riding Hood. Even then, the wolf was so dreadful that several of the smaller children had to be taken out. He started it off by producing the sound of a wolf howling in the distance. It was the most gruesome thing you've ever heard. The show went on, and the stories were a little more terrifying each time, and the children were mesmerised into complete silence. Then, there were a series of images of a little boy passing through the park, his park, in the evening. And this poor boy was followed, and then pursued and overtaken, and either torn in pieces or somehow made away with by a horrible hopping creature in white. You first saw it dodging among the trees, but gradually it appeared more and more plainly. Gave me one of the worst nightmares I ever remember. The children just stampeded to get out. There was the most dreadful trouble in the village afterwards. I'll tell you what, I feel very sorry for anyone who got into Carswell's bad books. A few days later, Edward Dunning was sitting in his usual desk in the select manuscript room of the British Library, settling down with a book he had to review when he thought he heard his own name. Dunning! Well, what? He turned round and in so doing brushed some of his papers onto the floor. No one there. Odd. I could have sworn. He had picked up all his papers, or so he thought, when a stout gentleman at the next desk, rising to leave, touched him on the shoulder. May I give you this? <coughs> I think it must be yours. Oh, yes. Thank you. Not at all. Good day. Excuse me, sir. Here's the second volume you wanted. I say, Watkins... Do you know who that well-built gentleman is? Uh, the, the one just leaving? Uh, yes, sir, that's Mr. Carswell. Would you like me to introduce you? Uh, no, no, that's quite all right, thank you. On the way home that night, Dunning felt that something ill-defined and impalpable had come between him and his fellow men. He felt the need of company on the bus, but the top deck quickly emptied. He looked round, nervously, and an advertisement caught his eye in blue letters on a yellow background. In memory of John Harrington, died September the 18th. Three months were allowed. That's a very queer advertisement. Take us, please. I say, I was looking at that advertisement. It's rather an odd one, isn't it? What advertisement's that, sir? Oh, I, uh, 
Oh, it was... Well, I thought... Oh, well, never mind. The night Dunning then spent is not one he looks back on with any pleasure. In bed, with the light out, he heard the unmistakable sound of his study door opening. Who's there? He stood leaning over the banister listening, but there was no further sound. Only a gust of warm air played for a moment round his ankles. So he got back into bed, and wanting to know what hour of the night it was, put his hand under the pillow for his watch. Only that was not what he found there. Oh! Oh! What was it? And what did you feel? A mouth with teeth and hair about it. Oh, not a human mouth. I was in the spare room with the door locked before I remember anything else. I spent the night there waiting every moment for something to come fumbling at the door. Well, you must stay with us for as long as you like. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Gayton. You are very kind. I met Carswell in the British Library. Carswell? I wonder if he knows it was I who wrote that review. Well, has anything else happened? Anything odd? No. Well... I saw a rather strange advertisement on my way home. It said, in memory of John Harrington, it gave a date, and then it said, just three months were allowed. I must have imagined it. When the conductor looked, it had gone. John Harrington. Why? Do you know him? Oh, Harrington was the secretary of the society before me. He organised a conference, this is a few years ago, and Carswell wanted to read a paper to the Society on alchemy. Harrington said it was rubbish. Paper duly kicked out. What happened to Harrington? Harrington fell out of a tree and broke his neck. I was at the inquest. It was a very odd business. I mean, here's a man, I mean, not a very athletic fellow, walking home along a country lane late in the evening. Suddenly... He begins to run like mad. I mean, they, they found his hat and bag. He shins up a tree. A dead branch gives way or something. He's found next morning with a broken neck. And the expression on his face. Oh. Look here. Harrington had a brother who tried to get to the bottom of it. He thought there was foul play. Perhaps you ought to meet him. Yes, I think I ought. Yes, Mr. Dunning. My brother suspected Carswell. How do you know? He went to a concert. This was about three months before he died. And he dropped his programme. A stout, clean-shaven man sitting next to him produced it and gave it back. Carswell? I think so. It was after this evening that my brother began to feel he was being followed. When he got home and was showing me the programme, he found tucked into it a little slip of paper with some very odd writing on it in red and black. That's yeah, very carefully done. It looks like runic letters. That must belong to my stout neighbour at the concert. I ought to give it back to him. But just then, a sudden draught took the paper and blew it straight into the fire. Oh, look, at it. It's gone. Have you read Carswell's book, Mr Dunny? Yes. Do you remember the chapter about what he called casting the runes on people? To gain their affection or... Uh... To get them out of the way, yes. Has Carswell ever given you anything? I believe he gave me back my notebook yesterday in the British Library. Where is it? Uh, here, in my bag. Let's have a look, shall we? Uh, here. Ah. Yes, here, look. A little strip of paper. It's exactly like the one my brother had. Careful. Oh, quick, uh, shut the window. It's all right. It just slipped out of my fingers. Uh, it's all right. I've got it. Mr. Harrington, tell me, how did your brother's trouble progress? A uh, feeling of unease, of being watched. Yes. It gradually grew stronger. After a while, I took to sleeping in his room. He talked in his sleep. What about? Uh, perhaps I oughtn't to dwell on that. What am I going to do? You must give that little slip of paper back. My brother had three months. I suppose you might have the same. They decided that Henry Harrington would go to stay as near to Carswell as he dared and keep a watch on his movements. Meanwhile, Dunning would alter his appearance as much as he could, shave off his beard and so on, and get ready to move if his confederate sent word of an opportunity. 
but the weeks passed and no word came. Less than five days before the end of the three-month period, a telegram arrived. K booked from Victoria for night ferry, Thursday night. Do not miss. We'll follow him on to train at Victoria. You travel on. Join train Croydon. Good luck. Harrington. The 20 minutes Edward Dunning spent on the platform at Croydon were the longest he had ever lived through. The train for the night ferry? Uh, this platform, sir. Y you're sure? Uh, quite sure, sir. What if he's not on it? What if the journey's just a ruse? <sighs> it's all right. There's Harrington looking out. Mustn't look at him. Get in another carriage. Dunning made his way slowly down the train until he found the compartment where Carswell was sitting. Is this seat taken? No. Thank you. He hasn't recognized me. How am I going to get it to him? Ah, there's his coat on the seat. Ah, no good. I've got to put it in his hand. Carswell got up from his seat and went out into the corridor. Now I could slip it in his bag. No, he's watching me through the door. Sit tight. Sit tight. He's coming back. He's restless, though. Carswell got up again and left the compartment, and this time something slipped off his seat and fell to the floor. It's his ticket in the little cardboard case. Quick. Don't worry, it's his time, or I'll change. Excuse me. Oh, uh, may I give you this? I believe it's yours. Is it? Yes, yes, it is. Much obliged. The few moments that remained were still moments of intense anxiety. Dunning did not know what a premature finding of the paper might lead to. He noticed that the carriage seemed to darken round them and to grow warmer. Carswell seemed fidgety and impressed. He drew his rough woolen coat towards him and cast it back as if it repelled him. Take us, please. I have a birth book. My name is Carswell. Uh, what about the other gentleman? What the devil do you mean? Well, beg pardon, sir. You could have sworn there was another gentleman right behind you. Or some sort of thing. Must be the light. My mistake, sir. All right. Harrington, did you do it? Yes. Well done. I feel a bit faint. Here, sit down. I believe I've just sent a man to his death. It's no more than he deserves. What do you think? What happens to a man, after the runes, I mean, when his time runs out? Do you remember my brother talked in his sleep? Yes. I think he saw it in his dreams. He described it. Shall I tell you what he said? No. Perhaps not. No. Oh, Mr. Wallace. What a horrid tale. Oh, but you don't believe it, do you, Violet? No. But what did happen to Carswell? He went missing at sea. It was presumed by the authorities that he had lost his footing and gone overboard. Oh. As a warning to reviewers, it's hardly of general use. Unless one comes across a necromancer. You never know when that might happen. Oh, we can't look for a black magician behind every gravestone. Why not? That's the fun of it. Because that has its own perils. Really? Oh, yes. I could tell you a story to illustrate my point. Aha! <laughs> I'll make some more cocoa, shall I? And tomorrow night you can hear a gothic tale in which a German baron falls victim to his own love of ghost stories. The Spectre Bridegroom is at a quarter to eight tomorrow.